All right. Um, uh, Mr. Torres, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can face each other if you like. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Torres. Um, and uh, your full name is Dr. Joseph E. e. Torres? Torres. Okay. Yes. Uh, tell us um, where you, what, what is today's date and uh, when you were born. But I was born April the 11th, 1923. And today is what, June the... Is it June the 6th? I, I've lost a little track of it. 19, or 2013, but I was born in 1923, April the 11th. Okay, and, and what are you doing here at this... Uh, I'm here at the GI Forum. I was the vice commander of the... when we reactivated the uh, GI Forum in El Paso, Texas. Yes, okay. Tell us about your parents. Uh, who were they? And my, where were they my born? My parents were born in Mexico. I'm a son of a first generation Mexi uh, Mexican-American, of course, but to me it's not Mexican, an American of Mexican heritage. Okay. I used to love to use that expression because to me uh, Mexican-American is a little bit hyphenated. Mm -hmm. And so with our ancestry is, with, uh, for both of my parents, my mother was born in Guadalajara mm -hmm. in that area close to, to the estado of Jalisco and Nayarit and in through there. Uh, and she was a güera of uh, Ojos Verdes Azules. Mm. My father was from the state of Chihuahua, mm -hmm. born in Janos and Asuncion, and raised in that area in Ciudad Juarez. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Mexican Revolution is what really brought them to the state. My mother, uh, uh, her mother brought them to the states because of the Mexican Revolution and the revolution itself, which well, I pride in killing, uh, killing the, the, the male and uh, abducting the women, literally, mm -hmm. see? And so my grandmother, with that in order to protect the younger women in the family, because my mother came from a family of 13, uh, brought them through, the, through Nogales, and uh, we don't really know how she got to El Paso, but my, uh, they found, uh, my mother was able to find work, uh, as I understand it, in the cosmetics department, because she was uh, a very attractive woman. Uh, in the cosmetics department, she was offered to work at the Popular Dry Goods Company which was a big dry goods store. Mm -hmm. And my father with a, was raised in Juarez and uh, his family was a little better to do. In fact, uh, I think that his family, with a, when they moved here to the States, with, and they moved to the States when uh, Pancho Villa took, uh, uh, with a, captured the city of Juarez mm -hmm. and his troops. And so they, they migrated because my grandfather had been a porfirista and uh, since they had been also landholders, uh, Pancho Villa were, had a different agenda, so right, right. they were fleeing, yes. actually. And this is where my father and mother were. So I am the son that I, who was indirectly helped by Pancho Villa because if it hadn't been for the fact they migrated, uh, this is where my parents uh, met. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Dr. Torres, uh, were you born in uh, in, in I El Paso? was born in El Paso, okay. El Paso County, Texas. Okay. And were you born at home at the hospital? No, I, I was born at home and uh, delivered by a midwife. In those days, it wasn't uncommon. And who was the partera? Do you remember? Yeah, Mrs. Escapite. Uh huh. That was her name, and I understand that she probably delivered more, more babies than many of our, mm -hmm. you know, today uh, uh, doctors that uh, mm -hmm. do deliver. Mm -hmm. I think at that time there were possibly two or three parteras. Uh, I later on came to meet. To meet uh, uh, that Dr. Kurita, who was a Japanese, with that, his mother had been a partera. Mm. So uh, it, it was quite unique because Japanese. Had, uh, yes. Oh. Uh, Jap mm. And yeah. tell us about uh, Miss Kurtera. Kurita? Kurita, excuse me. The Kurita. one that delivered you. No, no, I says Escapite. I don't know too much about her. Okay. I do know that she delivered everyone in our family. There were four of us. Uh -huh. uh, Escapite. Escapite. Wow. That's an unusual name. Uh, now, uh, did she live in uh, in El Paso? In, in El Paso. Okay. And, uh, and at that time, but I, literally, there were very few uh, and, uh, of those of us with a Spanish name but, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. were delivered by anything else but in Parteras, as mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. The history but, uh, behind all of that. Because mm -hmm. many of them couldn't afford it. Right. And you were delivered at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you know the... Do you know the, the the special circumstances when you were delivered at home that your mother uh, told you about? Well, uh, no. In fact, uh, uh, I had a car wreck, so there are some of the specifics I've uh, pretty well I can't recall. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I've learned to live with, uh, as a result of head injuries, I've learned to live with amnesia. Yes, sir. So some things are, that you're going to ask me are going to be a little bit uh, interesting and something that I've, you know, I'll do the best to yes, answer sir. for you. Okay. Now, uh, uh, my recall and everything is not, so it'll be more general. All right. Okay, now tell us uh, about your uh, the schools that you attended the in the school that elementary, for the example. The elementary, I, st I started in, in a school that was called Bailey at that time, which is no longer in existence there in El Paso. Mm. And Bailey uh, had mostly, probably mostly, uh, the Americans of uh, the Mexican heritage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, we had, you know, we had some Anglo-Saxon children uh, that went there. Uh, but uh, there weren't as numerous, so, but fortunately in time, right about the, when I was going to the fourth grade, uh, my father was able to move us and could afford by that time, he was a bookkeeper at the time, move us up to what we called uh, Dudley. And although we lived in the areas between two wealthier parts of El Paso, I was able to go to uh, a school that probably had no more than 10 Hispanic families. Mm. And uh, so my, uh, my thinking uh, was I was able to develop to the point where I could think more as as an Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. and, and translate into Spanish, but my parents always made sure that I, uh, I, I was a little bit better versed in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I said, so it was only natural for me to take it in high school. Mm -hmm. Now, after graduating from Dudley, then I went to El Paso High School. Okay, but Dudley was a middle school or elementary school? No, Dudley, they didn't have middle schools in those days. Okay. Now, you went through the seventh grade and uh, mm -hmm. then from there you went to El Paso or the, or the high school. Okay, okay, okay. And what, was, what were your experiences when you were going to this, uh, was it a pri predominantly Anglo school? Oh, yes. What, what were your experiences there? Uh, very good because I was kind of like the huerito mm -hmm. around there, so I, I didn't have the problems that many that many have because if they were a little bit darker, <laughs> darker than you I were was, so I, I, I was a huerito. Uh -huh. okay? yeah. And uh, the funny thing is that I recall that I, uh, my mother always, I was always Pepito because my father had been Pepe and my abuelo had been uh, Jose de la Luz Torres, so in order to distinguish between all the Jose's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a way. And then I remember one little uh, Anglo-Saxon girl there she couldn't say Pepito, so she used to call me Puppy Toes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my experiences were very good, and uh, fortunately, I was able to have in the fourth grade a, a teacher who used to even sit me on a lap today. That would be probably called harassment. But at that time, uh, I guess I had a, a pretty keen mind, so she used to use me as an example of how to, you know, how mathematics should be used and how well my mind was able to to you know, give her back the answers. So she would ask me to subtract and add. And she would sit you on her lips. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she was angry with it. Yeah. Uh, but it was always because I, uh, you know, she would uh, try to use me as an example yes, in spelling sir. also. Mm -hmm. And I was very good at spelling and, and, and things like that. So I, I actually, I, I think I had a pretty charmed life in, in that respect. And, uh, Mr. Torres, uh, one, one uh, one subject that I want to talk about also is, can you tell us about some of the homegrown um, Mexican-American schools in the area of El Paso that you may know about that were started because of the segregation problems that, the, uh, com that our community had in those early years? Do you know of any schools, any persons that started their own schools in, uh, over there where only Raza were going to school? Well. Uh there were there, there were mostly the south side of us, and that, that at one time that's where my mother lived. She lived on, and most uh, most uh, most uh, recent immigrants uh, lived up in the area of Seventh Street and uh, and Stanton in, in in that immediate area. And many of my friends and we, because El Paso wasn't very big, but uh, they were, uh, and they lived in the south side of that, and uh, families that my mother knew and we used to visit with them. Mm -hmm. Schools like Aoy, but uh, in Burleson later on, uh, although they had uh, different names. Aoi was uh, one that uh, saw a tremendous need in El Paso for, for you know, a school that could uh, be, really teach and teach some of our individuals. But I'm very pleased to say that uh, not long ago we honored one of our uh, uh, veterans there at, uh, who had gone and had gotten the Medal of Honor, both at Aoi because he was a graduate of Aoi and also a graduate of Bowie. 
And so Boy was a, the predominantly Hispanic, so was Aloy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, it was rare to see an Anglo, unless they happened to be so extremely poor, mm -hmm. that never went to, to any of those schools. Now, um, you, you had a successful uh, uh, career uh, while studying at the university. Uh, how did that begin? Well, it, it, it began in 1941. I graduated from high school, and I, in the summer I decided that, well, uh, since uh, things were, you know, kind of speeding up, and uh, I, was, I used to uh, deliver papers and sell papers and uh, do little, uh, all kinds of odd jobs because it was necessary at the time for the whole family to be involved in trying to, in trying to bring home the money, and uh, I started uh, uh, selling magazines at the age of five. And so I always had, my father used to say, well, you're, you know, using up more of your uh, uh, shoe leather uh, selling and uh, it coming up with only, out of every five cents, I think I was getting a, a, a penny and a half. But then at that time, you could buy a hamburger for five cents mm -hmm. or a Coney Island hot dog for five cents. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the economy itself was, mm -hmm. was uh, conducive to where, you know, even a penny and a half was better than nothing. Mm -hmm. okay. So you leave high school and you and you transition then, into then, what? Then I transitioned because at the time, uh, in 1941, we were very close to the getting into war. Mm -hmm. And uh, things had gotten pretty hot in Germany and uh, we didn't realize that Japan would be attacking us so soon. So I took a course at that time in 1941 because I graduated in three and a half years. I was in a little bit of a hurry to get out of high school. So I could get to work. Mm. By that time, in 19, uh, uh, let's see, about 19, uh, four, I had to be right around 1939. My father and mother became separated, and I became the, the head of the family. I was the oldest, mm -hmm. and so uh, even what I made in a newspaper route was able to keep us, keep 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 the family together. Mm. But uh, including also, your mother and your brothers and, and sisters. My brother and sister, there were there were uh, one sister and, uh, and and three brothers by that time, uh, three of us brothers. Okay. Uh, okay. And so uh, and then they came up with a that summer they wanted to teach a course in what we called aeronautical drafting, mm -hmm. and we had a professor even come in from New Mexico State, which is in in New Mexico, and there were quite a few of us Hispanics that took the course. Mm -hmm. in it, and some of them did go to work in the, in California with the aircraft industry. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one of them, one of my friends there, did stay with uh, one of the companies. In fact, him and I still visit. He comes in from Palm Springs. He's also a World mm -hmm. War II veteran. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some of them that took the course. But at that time, my father was working for the Southern Pacific Railroad, and he had a, a job. And I, and, uh, he offered me a job uh, as a recruiting agent, so at, at age 18 I became a recruiting agent for the mm -hmm. Southern Pacific Railroad, and uh, I even came to Houston. I, and I was 18 years old, I remember how they used to put cowboy boots on me and even a, a little Stetson, so I'd look a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So I was really the first Hispanic, and I didn't realize that I was going into areas where there was more prejudice evident <coughs> than what we had in El Paso. Mm -hmm. They, in other words, in El Paso, it was more indirect and mm -hmm. a little more. And more what, what kind of experiences did you have that were racist? In well, uh, even e even here, but uh, uh, I guess it because of my, you know, my being a little more of a widow, it was unusual for them, and many people had a hard time with uh, really pinpointing what I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Uh, and it was unique because later on, as I was talking to some even in Victoria, Texas, they said, do you mean that they called you mister? I said, yes, would you believe it? And I guess the card that I carry, because it said representative of Southern Pacific Railroad, you know, that uh, that also helped to make quite a difference. Okay. I want to transition now into your college years. Um, um, what were your college years like, and uh, at, at what point did you become a doctor? Okay, well, I, I, I served in the military as, as soon after because my sister was able to graduate, so uh, I came back from, uh, from I had, at that time I had also gone to Oakland, California. I left the railroad and uh, got a job as a marine machinist up in Oakland, a trainee marine machinist. But then most of my friends were already going into the military, so I came back and told the 
the, the civil service uh, uh, board, and I, uh, the, I mean the the, uh, the draft board. At that time, I asked them why they hadn't called me. They hadn't called me for a while, and I came back there, and I had gone on vacation home and went down and said, well, why haven't I been called? My sister has already gotten out, and this was the agreement we had. So soon after that, I, I found myself going into the military, and uh, while I was in the military, I went into the infantry. I was to the infantry where I ran into a sergeant for uh, Gonzalez here from San Antonio, and he took a special liking because here we were Hispanics, uh, and he found out that uh, I, I guess I had boxed, uh, and so he found that out because I happened to deck some individual that bounced me off the top bunk. Mm -hmm. So as a result, I was placed on the boxing team, and uh, later on he, they held me back to teach the next group. I was supposed to go to infantry OCS, where a, a sergeant friend of mine came in one day and said, well, if we're good enough to be infantrymen and infantry officers, we're good enough to be Air Force cadets, so I transferred into the Air Force. And that also gave me an opportunity to, to get together my education. I was sent to the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, and I was the only Hispanic at that time mm -hmm. there. But uh, I found that I could, uh, I had an ability to, to get together very well with uh, even Norwegians that, that were there, Scandinavians. In fact, uh, one individual called me the sweet Mexican mm -hmm. because I, I could imitate them and I could speak like you know speak uh, English mm -hmm. with a with a broken accent like they did. So mm -hmm. it was it was easy. Give us an I, example, Mister. Uh, well, I had a little girlfriend by the name of Alva Olson, and she was taller. She was blonde, uh -huh. and it was always my Yosef, and uh, and it was uh, Alva Olson. And where do you come from? And she'd say. I come from just across the river in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, and so uh, I would get into my, my routine and she'd say, and my Yosef, and where do you come from? And I uh, would always say, I come from just down the river, a little base down there in the, on the Rio Grande. And, and, uh, but we got to the <laughs> point where I could say, yomping yimini and things like that. <laughs> and then you. the Irish thought I was Irish. Uh, uh, so we had a mixture, and one fellow said, oh, go over there goes that sweet Mexican one uh. time because he had asked me where my parents had immigrated. And most people really didn't know what a Mexican, especially in these areas, was supposed to be like. So there was no, there wasn't much of a stereotyping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now you, um, now we're at, uh, at the point where you've graduated from college? Well, the, no, or, uh, I, I made it through cadet training in the Air Force. Okay, okay. And so I got my second lieutenant, and then later on when I was getting my uh, first lieutenant promotion. Then I, uh, I was asked by uh, one of my commanders. Uh, you know, that he said I would like to promote you, and uh, you know, you have a name, that uh, Jose Ernesto Torres, mm -hmm. and he spoke enough Spanish that he could say to me, "Have you ever thought of being first lieutenant Joseph Torres?" And that's how my name uh, officially was changed mm -hmm. to Joseph. And it was in uh, the military. In, in, in other words, it was my acceptance of being. An American of Mexican heritage. I got you. Yes. I got you. And so the transition was made. I came back, but that from the war, and that, in other words, after having served in Europe, and then coming, supposedly to go to be to serve against Japan. Fortunately, the war ended. Uh, I didn't have to put my. Uh, I was learning all about the atomic bomb. I didn't have to put that into uh, uh, into practice. At least I never dropped a bomb. I was. I was supposed to be an atomic bombardier by that time I had come back from uh, from Europe and so to go to Japan fortunately we didn't need some men so and then I got out of the military but everything within the military also I found that since the curriculum was such and we had to everything was thrown at you so fast on the college level that when I got to college it was real easy for me to enroll at the uh, the old Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy. I had thought of pursuing the engineering degrees that I had started on. And this uh, was in the war in El Paso. Okay. Uh, but then I went down to get my teeth cleaned, and uh, somebody started talking to me because I also came from a family where some of the family were a bunch of MDs. Mm. Uh, Your family. family? Yes, on my father's side. Okay. That's the Rodarte family. The Rodartes were were doctors. In fact, one of them later on <coughs> became head of staff right there at uh, Temple, Texas, and he was on the medical board of the state. So we, we've had quite a few uh, 
doors on on that side of the family. Mm -hmm. And but everything was preparing me for me to make it fit a lot easier for me to get enrolled and and uh, make my uh, education such an easy thing for me to do. So I, in two and a half years, I had graduated from the old College of Mines and Metallurgy. I was mm -hmm. able to take 21 semester hours in front of Wow. I was given because I had the, I had the, the grades. A semester? Let's see, yeah. 21 semester yeah. hours. And 15 during the summer. And I got my degree mm -hmm. in 1948. Uh, I was accepted at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And this would all play a big part on my life because I was educated by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. right. And I married, I married a little, little gal from Omaha because I had been there you know, in in uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, mm -hmm. prior, and the little girl had grown up, and uh, mm -hmm. and this is uh, we were able to raise a family this mm -hmm. later on. Now, your doctor degree is in uh, in, in what area? Dental surgery. Dental surgery. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm a doctor of dental surgery. I was the first Hispanic that came back to El Paso. I I had a lot of opportunities to stay in. Uh, Iowa. In fact, I was. They were recruiting me to try to stay in Iowa because of the grades that I, and the fact that I had done so well on on the state board. I think I was beaten by one tenth of a point by by another fellow, and he was from Marquette. So uh, you know, in other words, it was easy for me to assimilate information. I had become a good listener, Mira. Yes, a good observer, and so mm -hmm. forth. So, uh, uh, so I didn't stay in in Iowa or Nebraska, and I, you know, I guess I always had a longing and uh, I knew that there was a need in El Paso when, uh, that w we the Hispanics needed to have role models and after all if, if your you know knowledge if it's not disseminated is is mm -hmm. worthless so so it tell must me, be shared so tell me about your your uh, your first experiences with uh, with the American GI Forum where did that begin okay. what they, did it, that it's begin? very unusual because I was flying reserves while I was going through through college now uh, mm -hmm. One day, I found myself that we had gone to San Antonio and had blown in because I was with the Air Force at that time. And this was during the summer, approximately about 1947, and and uh, we happened to meet. That's just how I happened to meet uh, Dr. Hector P. Garcia. Mm -hmm. okay? But there was a lot of movements that were going on at, at that time. Albert Armendariz had joined the Lulax. The Lulax were, were beginning to become a a kind of a focal point for most everybody to, to gather, but uh, since I had married a little Anglo girl, girl, it was a little bit difficult for me to, to 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 see myself in an organization that was mostly Hispanic. But my idea was to gather everybody and for everybody to pull up together at one time. In mm -hmm. other words, not not for just to address certain grievances, but to try to uplift the whole community. So this is in 1948. This is 1947, 47 in San Antonio when I met Hector, and I found him to be very charismatic. In fact, uh, uh, for a long time there we were considering, but I and I, uh, but uh, I decided to go it all alone, and uh, to, this is the way that I would do my my thing. Okay, so you begin uh, with which chapter uh, of the American GI Forum? It wasn't until just recently when I began all of this, and Carlos and I decided to activate. Because we had been on in other orga organizing other things together. Okay. Say. All right. So tell us about how uh, those activities uh, finally um, consummated to the point where you become an American GI Forum member. What are some of the other activities you were involved in? Well, I was uh, voted the first Hispanic, uh, uh, the outstanding Hispanic, uh, in 1961 in El Paso, Texas, by the service clubs of El Paso. And this, I, I <coughs> don't believe it ever happened to anyone. So and, when and, and then I got to ride in the Sun Carnival in 1961, where the, mm -hmm. uh, behind Conrad Hilton, they honored Conrad Hilton, they honored me, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was beginning to to get. And then later on, I was also honored in being uh, voted the uh, the president of Act of the West Texas Dental Association, mm -hmm. which uh, after a meeting in San Angelo, this was the honor that was presented me, you know, for my contributions that had. Come along in the field of dentistry mm -hmm. uh, because I got very much involved and in even within the community and helping the orphans, uh, uh, being a, uh, uh, you know, being within the military. Uh, at that time, I want to bring you back to something so that you can be have a look. In about 1941, Company E of El Paso, which was had a lot of my friends 
from uh, Bowie High School that got, uh, there were no Hispanic officers that I can recall. Uh, the highest ranking officer was a sergeant. But when we came back, uh, fortunately, uh, Captain Delgado, who, who was, uh, I mean, Captain Del Valle, who was from Bowie, had been an ex-football player at the old College of Mines and Metal, decided to get a group of us officers together and we would meet with our wives. Uh, and so we had this little group that we had and I'm the only one left out of that group. We were mostly from El Paso High, Bowie, and Cathedral High School. Mm -hmm. they, but and what was the purpose, what was the mission of this group? The mission of this group was just to keep ourselves forged on community activities and trying to do more, by so setting a, a better example for the Hispanics. Okay, so give us some concrete examples, uh, Dr. Torres, that you all uh, were involved in with this group that you mentioned. Mostly education. Okay. And, uh, and uh, we got so involved also that we were also involved politically. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the involvement that we had at that time was to get Raymond Tejas as a, our first county commissioner, and this is uh, probably 19, 1947 because we became organized about <coughs> 1946. So we were involved. We were also became members of the Kiwanis Club of El Paso. So we had all these mm -hmm. little things that we were being asked to join, and uh, some of these organizations like the 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 uh, Mount Franklin Kiwanis, uh, which later on came back. So we were getting more Hispanics involved in some of the, uh, which had been predominantly all Anglo okay. organizations. Now the uh, the Chicano Civil Rights Movement uh, primarily emerges in the 1960s. Exactly. How were you connected to the Chicano movement, and what contributions did you make? Well, uh, in I retrospect, think that, uh, in retrospect, I, I believe that the whole movement had its incipiency uh, due to World War II, mm -hmm. because. Many of us came back with the idea, uh, in other words, that this was our uh, moment, our right moment for us, in other words, our rite of passage. I refer to it as a rite of passage, mm -hmm. due to the fact that be, being a history major, I had read about how, and what, how the, uh, agricultural people, and we had a lot of people that had come out of Mexico which were basically all agricultural people. Right. The Irish had had the same condition because they were they were facing famine in World War One and being a student of, and these movements are to occur and thank God for the for the military, the Irish had, in World War One had done it and uh, there were so there were so many of us in World War Two with the Spanish last name mm -hmm. that uh, we had really begun this is how our but that rite of passage had begun, and it really began within the military. Mm -hmm. So your your um, your thinking is, and your experiences are that um, the Chicano movement begins in the military. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And what were the, the the specific events that took place that you remember in the military that justify uh, your assertion? Well, I, but it, it, the circumstances, the uh, the fact that we were being called upon, the fact that uh, we had come out of a si se puede no te and, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 we were there, <coughs> is, and I believe that uh, Anke Romero said it very well that sometimes we felt that uh, we were asked to do twice as much. And who is Anke Romero? Anke Romero was a paratrooper, uh, my neighbor, and he was uh, a T.Y. Indian and also of Mexican heritage, so he had the. The, the two backgrounds, Miss Roy. and uh, he has just passed away, but a very fine young man who would uh, later on go on to, to sharing his examples, Miss, within the, the the 82nd Airborne, which he had been a part of, but, uh, and, and go to the schools because we found a great need uh, within the schools to, to disseminate as much information as we could in the movements and how today we are at where we are. So let me end with this uh, for now, <clears throat> Dr. Torres. Looking back at all those experiences that you've had uh, within the Hispanic, Latino, Chicano movement, um, what would you change today if your mission were to improve the graduation rates of our youth? The graduation rates, I, well, the, you know, most of that becomes comes home. And at one time, I used to say because I was very much related. I was, uh, in fact, the first. Uh, uh, I remember I, I, when I came to El Paso. I 
decided that I was going to do something even for the football players. Mm -hmm. And so I made them the first mouth protectors. Uh, most of our boys in the Golden Gloves, uh, all they ever got was a sponge and were sent out into the ring, so I made custom protectors. And most of them were Hispanic uh, mm -hmm. children, or, the, or the Americans of Mexican heritage, mm -hmm. uh, kids from the bottom. Right, right. Eh? And many of them didn't have it, so I, these were my contributions. And uh, fortunately, Kiwanis was able to provide me with them, buy the materials, <coughs> and I was able to provide my free services. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, with, within the uh, everything that had, and it was always education, education, mm -hmm. education. And uh, there were some of us that were already setting setting that trend. In other words, that uh, no matter what it cost us, and, 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 and many of us had to work. Yes. Afterwards, in other words, it wasn't just going to school and not working. You had mm -hmm. because our, even many of our families couldn't afford to pay even the tuition as mm -hmm. low as it was in those days. Mm -hmm. But then the GI Bill did offer us an awful lot, but we came out. Right. right. And it's like me; I was able to save my GI Bill, and it paid for my whole dental education later on. So I was able to had enough time in the military there you know, where my whole education just about in, in dental school was paid for. Well, Mr. Uh, Torres, I want to uh, personally uh, commend you for all Thank of the you. great work that you've done for the well, community. We, it's and, it's uh, been very rewarding. It's, a, it's, it's, it's really, a, I can say to anybody, it's so satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, this to me was also my way of honoring so many of my friends that didn't make it back. Mm -hmm. For a long time there, I used to say, "Well, why God? Why me? Why did I make it back?" But uh, today, I'm, you know, I know the Lord had a, a good purpose for all of us that have lived this long. And what is your favorite dicho? Uh, si se puede, no te bajes, y así se hace. <laughs> okay. All right. Bueno. Okay. Gracias, señor. Usted. Okay. And let's keep the movement going because it is a legacy, and I hope that this legacy is something that uh, others can profit from. El movimiento que siga. Tiene que seguir. Sí, señor. Tiene que seguir. We've only touched the very, the, that we, all we did was lay the foundation and it must go on. Mm. We've got a, a big building that we have to build. You remind me of Américo Paredes. 